So, um, any, any questions or, or thoughts arising immediately? Um, straight away down the front, I have a couple of people, please. Angela will wend her way. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name's Deborah Dickinson. I'm from Freedom Studios. Hello. Three questions in one. Okay. Um, can you put in more than one application? So? Yes. Yes. Okay. Two, can you include international work in the applications, working with other companies in other countries? Yes, so the lead, um, the, 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 the bid must be led by an arts and culture organisation that's based in England, so that's the parameter we're working within. But going back to the point about partnerships, um, the arts and culture organisation may choose to partner with an organisation that's not based, an arts organisation that's not based in England or in the UK for that matter. Um, and likewise, the technology providers um, may also be partners that are not based within England. The key thing is, is that the grant that we're awarding will be going to a organisation based in England, for this particular fund at least. And okay. the last question, if you're already um, talking with researchers, for example, we are at an academic institution and working on a project with them, can they become part of the bid or will you allot researchers? Yeah, there was, th this has come up actually a number of times. I mean, one of the things when we were designing this R&D fund that we had to, one of the trade-offs that we faced was that do we um, sort of stipulate that arts and culture organisations identify their own research partners in the way that we're doing with the technology providers? Um, or do we sort of try and build some sort of other research infrastructure to connect organisations with researchers? And there are pros and cons of both ways. Um, what we've decided to do is go with the, the, the latter of those two options. So what we're doing is we're, in some sense, providing R&D services to the arts organisations. The reason why we did that was because some of the feedback we received, that, um, and certainly consistent with my own experience of working in these areas, is that not all organisations have those pre-existing relationships. Um, what we're trying to do is really encourage, through our separate call for expressions of interest to researchers, if you're, if you're academics and researchers that already have a relationship, please apply. Please respond to that um, expression of interest because that will clearly leave you well placed um, to sort of participate in the fund. The other thing to say is that um, we're not, it, it is a call, it's, an ex, it's a call for expressions of interest for researchers. We, we deliberately haven't set, organized a competition at this stage because what we want to do, this two day workshop that I mentioned, and those of you who are familiar with the Research Council's sort of ways of working, it's, it's sort of adapt, building on the sand pit sort of model. What we wanted is an intensive period, which before the actual researchers have been allocated to projects, there's an opportunity for all the researchers that are shortlisted to meet the organisations and the technology companies and really see if there are some connections and actually develop methodologies in situ. Um, so, so I'm hoping through that route we won't end up with a situation whereby we have a very strong relationship, pre-existing relationship between a, an academic team um, and an arts organisation um, that, that in some sense is sort of falsely... <laughs> You know, but, but there, is, there, is, there is that risk of that. Um, and, uh, and the other key thing to mention, incidentally, is, is that the, f the, the focus of this fund is very much on audience engagement, depth as well as sort of breadth and width, and, and the business model side as well. And um, consequently, if there are pre-existing relationships with academic institutions and arts organisations in working in that area, then I doubly encourage the academics to respond to our expressions of interest because that is very much the focus you know, of this fund, um, whereas of course there are many other healthy relationships between academic institutions and arts organisations where they don't work in these particular areas. So, okay. that's clear. Can a, can a university apply directly? That's that. Can a university, can apply, a university apply directly? So if, um, this goes back to the issue of what an arts and cultural organisation is, um, and there have been, you can imagine, we've had a number of instances of people saying, am I an arts and cultural organisation? And we try to address, uh, clarify this through our frequently answered questions. Um, a university can, so for example, in certain circumstances, if you, for example, have a gallery or museum, if you have a self-contained arts and cultural organisation, essentially, yeah. within a university, they can apply. Can an, a university apply, for example, if you have a practice-based researcher um, uh, in, in their own, uh, in their own, in their own you know, as, a, as a university department? Um, the, the answer is basically no. Um, but, Andrew, is there anything you want to sort of chip in on there? Because I know this is quite important to get the the distinction's right. <laughs> no, university cannot apply, but a university, so just as Susan said, so an independent, a functioning independent kind of organisation, library, gallery, 
um, museum that sits underneath the umbrella of a university can apply mm -hmm. as an arts and culture organization. And we particularly made that distinction. It does sort of exclude some organizations that do consider themselves to be arts and cultural institutions, universities that are kind of dedicated specifically to arts and whatnot. But we have made that kind of distinction at this moment for this fund. And so, yeah. OK. Um, we had a gent here, I think, was waving at me. Were you waving at me? Yeah. Have you, have you been caught in the yeah, three-fold question? Yeah, it's Roger McKinley from FACT. You, you're going to hear from me a bit later anyway, but the, the third part of the question answered my question Okay, anyway. brilliant. Uh, just a little, just a oh, very quick one. Go on, um, then. What, just then a quick here. idea of the timeline for the call for expressions of interest from researchers. I'm not sure if you actually... Uh, yes. It's live, isn't it? it? So the call's already live. Um, the deadline is, I think we've coincided it, September the 2nd. Is that right, Angela? You have to correct me. Yes, yeah. Um, and, um, but there is a separate page on the website if you want to look and get more details about what's involved. Okay, we're trying to force you to ask a question, aren't we? You, if you go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, my question is because um, I'm Jenny Inchbroad from Future Artists, and we worked for a couple of years now very much in the transmedia environment, um, very much self financed, and, and our thing is about raising, raising audience awareness and digital business models. Um, and we're sort of based looking more towards film. And one of the things that I wanted to know was, for example, for us, a natural partner would be somebody like the BFI, maybe. Mm. Given the timeline, we probably wouldn't be able to have any confirmations from the BFI in terms of funding if we wanted to do some kind of collaboration on it. But would it be possible to bring them in at a later date and be a little bit ad hoc about it? Richard, do you want to tackle that? Or should I go to Hassan? Um, you go. Well, I, I love the idea of... of um, trying to bring the BFI in for a start. I think that's, that's a great um, idea and um, you know, I hope that we can do that. Um, I think uh, the reality will be that, that the more confirmed the partnerships are, the more likely that we're going to be able to support the projects. So um, I think however much you can push to get clarification in advance of the Almost deadline. Everybody goes away. Yeah. Yeah. So it's tough. It's not it's going tough. to be... It it's would, tough. It, that thing is that I might be able to get confirmation, but it might not be until maybe the first week of November or something. Which Ma I know, in terms of the application, isn't necessarily going to help me. But if I was successful and then that then came on board within that project, is that something that would be manageable? If I warned you beforehand, I think. I mean, to, in this, I, th I mean, I think the best thing is to try to be clear. Really, I mean, I think that the, the, for this particular fund, the timelines are so tight. It's very difficult, frankly, I think, to work with that. I mean, obviously, there is a bit of a below line here because, you know, if you've got a, an ama if, uh, you know, you've got an amazing testable proposition, which, you know, which is demonstrably of, you know, it's a burning question that everyone wants to know the answer to. Um, clearly, in that situation, um, one would want to treat that differently from uh, from a project which doesn't meet any of the other criteria. But I think, you know, the chances are, given the interest that we've had so far in the fund and the, the size of it. Um, I mean, I really appreciate the demanding timelines, incidentally, it's created all sorts of uh, issues for us, you can imagine, in terms of getting things off the ground. But I think the key thing, again, is going back to what Richard was saying earlier about the wider Arts Council strategy. Um, what we're trying to do through this fund is just to test if there are projects of the sorts that funders should really be supporting um, to, to promote and support innovation. And therefore, I hope people would not put off developing projects like that just because of the timing. But I do appreciate that there's a real challenger. Yeah, but my question is, is if the BFI finance comes in after this is done, oh. is that going to be okay? Well, That's well, my question. Well, there's two issues there, because there's the issue of BFI, part of, you mentioned finance, so there's a second issue here about co-funding. So if an organisation bit, so £100,000 is the limit that's available for our activities, but of course if an, if an applicant wants to co you know, get some co-funding in, then clearly that's not a problem at all. And in fact, the more other things being equal, um, in the sense that co-funding will probably mean a larger scale experiment um, and therefore is more likely to more robust insights and that's a good thing. So clearly, so if, if you haven't, you know, if, if you're in part discussions with the BFI about co-funding but haven't secured that, then certainly put that in, right? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we've got one time for one more. Gen gent in the blue, I'm sure. Everybody will be around, um, members of the panel will be around for the rest of the morning, in fact all day, um, in terms of um, Hassan and Richard. Oh, sorry, where are we going? Oh, okay, all right. I didn't see that. Okay, well, we'll do two more. Hi, Sorry, Skind didn't see Skinder Hundal from New Art Exchange. Hello. I, I wanted to hi. I wanted to ask a question around um, the business modelling, um, audience development and audience reach, and deepening uh, that relationship between 
spaces, um, communities, audiences, etc., is comprehensible. But when you refer to business modelling, mm. what are you referring to in yeah. that? Uh, I mean, look, even audience engagement and depth, you know, I mean, I'm sure you'll agree. I mean, these are all problematic concepts. What we've tried to do uh, is give definitions. So all these concepts I've just mentioned, they're all defined on the call, and you'll see links. Um, I mean, one of the things that we are, you know, even research and development, frankly, um, is a problematic context in the arts and cultural context because, you know, although it's, it's the, the official definitions are very much grounded in science and technology, uh, and clearly this fund is, is, is not focusing on pure technological innovation. So, so the first thing is to say is that really um, one of the reasons why um, we're doing a fund like this is to actually improve our own understanding and funders' understandings of what innovation, R&D, business model, audience engagement actually means. So, so with that big, big qualifier, the question on business models, we've deliberately gone for a definition from the, from the museology literature, actually. So it's a quite a broad definition. If you look through the, the, the link, um, it's, 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 it's certainly, we're, we're, we're wanting to allow for the fact that arguably all the organisations that are going to be applying for this fund, but certainly um, some of them, um, are likely to be operating in mixed funding, mixed value sort of environments where they're creating public value, cultural value, whatever, however they, think, they want to think about their core missions uh, uh, and not just profits. So the business model definition we've got is actually rather broad, um, but, and, and it's from the museology literature, very much a public value definition. But do, do take a look at it on the website and see what you think. Can, can I just add, Richard, add to yeah. that? Because I think, I think there are two practical things that we um, need to be looking at here. One is around the concept of sustainability and resilience and the degree to which arts and cultural organisations yeah. can use digital technology to enable them to develop their business model in such a way that it can be more resilient for the future, bearing in mind the, 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 um, the reality that in particular public funding uh, and other sources of investment may be, may be reducing. So that there's, a, there's a kind of criticality there about how do we sustain the, the viability and the operation mm -hmm. of arts and cultural organisations and can we use digital technology in some way to support that. Secondly, I just wanted to add that one of the themes very much talks about this in terms of um, efficiency and how we can use um, mm -hmm. digital technology to help us to do things more effectively, more efficiently and possibly cheaper. Uh, so I think it's thinking about those kinds of things uh, when we're thinking about um, business models as well. So that's the theme we call resources, which there'll be a session on later on. Okay, and um, Gent here, we've got the mic, and then we will have to wrap it, I'm afraid. Otherwise, you won't get your morning influx of caffeine. Miles Hi. Gary from Monster Camerata. I just had a quick question, actually, for Richard. I was wondering, could you just say a bit more about the relation between this fund and the 20 million fund that you talked about? Are they totally exclusive? Are you seeing them as totally separate, or is this a sort of lead-in preparation for the other fund? And also, if you are successful for the Nesta fund, um, will you accept another application for the, for the 20 million fund? Yes, it's very much uh, a kind of learning moment for us. Um, as, as Hassan described it, this is not a huge amount of money, um, but we do want to use it to learn from the kinds of projects and the kind of ideas that we can develop through it. Um, and uh, if you are successful in this fund, then that doesn't preclude you from uh, applying for uh, the, the other funds later on. We haven't quite specified what they are in, in precise terms yet, partly because we want to learn from what we're doing here in order to inform that. But I very much would see that the kind of ideas that we're talking about here are likely to drive into uh, the larger funds. And, and partly because, as I said earlier, uh, the demand is being demonstrated. The fact that so many people are interested in doing stuff in this area means that there's a lot that we could achieve across the sector. So um, I think we very much look to uh, further investment in this, in this area. Okay, great. Sorry to cut a discussion off as it uh, got going there, but um, we've um, um, case studies and things to do after the coffee break. So um, we'll break for a, a cup of coffee. Thank you very much, everybody on the panel. They um, um, are all staying around if you want to buttonhole them with specific questions. Um, and we'll break and we'll, if you could be back at 11.55, please, sharp, um, then we can, uh, we can kick on with the next session. Thank you very much.